I would like to add my own thanks to the Weniger Committee for formally recognizing my contribution to the work of the Seventh-day Adventist Church over a good many years. It is heartwarming to have your work noticed and, and honoured. I am grateful to receive this award and be mentioned in the same sentence as Charles Eliot Weniger, who as Professor of English and Dean of the Seminary, was himself known for his excellent contribution to Adventist education. I am certain he would agree, nevertheless, that the greatest reward has come from the people, the students and the colleagues who have walked beside us over, the, over these years. And thanks go too to Clinton Emerson, for whom this lecture is named, for keeping the legacy of Charles Veniger alive. Grateful and honoured though we are to be recognised, we would be foolish not to recognise also that there's something arbitrary about such awards. I can think of many of our Newbold colleagues over the years whose work has been a deeply valuable investment in the lives of generations of students. They were excellent in the classroom, in the personal support that they offered to students, and in the communities that they helped to nurture. We are deeply indebted to them. So too all those teachers and students throughout the Adventist schools and colleges in Europe whom, with, with whom Helen and I have worked over many years. Many excellent in their own way. They may go uncelebrated today, but their efforts still help to sustain the church, nurture the poor, and leaven the whole in the public space. Excellence seems like such a simple thing, just being outstandingly good at something. But it is not so simple, especially in the Christian context. Our English word excellence comes from Latin roots, meaning to stand out in height or be a culmination. It seems that if one stands out from others, they must in turn form a mass of averageness for the sake of comparison. Jesus made clear his distaste for such human comparisons. In the Bible, excellence, excellent, is usually a descriptor of God, not of human beings. The Greek philosopher Aristotle had much to say about excellence as a virtue. And so I want to walk for a moment in the company of both Aristotle and Jesus to eavesdrop on an exchange between them on this theme. A word then ab about excellence and comparison. When in 2012, Time magazine named Stanley Harvass as the best theologian in America, he responded by saying that best is not a theological category. It's true. There are surprisingly few uses of the word best in the Bible, and they mostly refer to things like wine, food, and land. So if excellent has a notion of bestness within it, then we as a Christian community should perhaps, perhaps be rather wary about employing it. I've always been nervous and suspicious of references to a C student or to an A student. While the label may offer a useful shorthand, it is not without its dangers. All teachers have taught C students who put, who put every effort into their academic achievements, who later make a very important contribution to the community, and who were simply wonderful human beings. And by the same token, we would have taught students, A students, whose work came easily to them, 
and who could become complacent or even arrogant. In Christian education, excellence can never simply be about a superior position on a bell curve. It is also about endeavour, surmounting obstacles, being curious and challenging your own best efforts rather than those of others. Jesus said that secular ways of measuring should not predominate among his followers. It, will, it should not be so amongst you. Whoever wishes to be first among you must be your slave. Aristotle, by contrast, cared little for slaves and considered that only members of the Athenian elite were capable of excellence. Excellence and moderation. An important part of Aristotle's notion of uh, virtue was moderation. For example, courage was a virtue in his judgment, but it was important to distinguish it from recklessness. There was no virtue in seeking martyrdom. His idea is in the same family as temperance, a Christian fruit of the Spirit. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 9 and Galatians 5 teaches us that we should be temperate in all things and that we should avoid jealousies, selfish ambitions, envies. We do our work as well as, well as we can but not at the expense of other human values, nor so that we can beat others into second place, but rather that we can serve others. We do not sacrifice everything just to be top dog. So excellence and moderation live slightly uncomfortably with each other, and on that Jesus and Aristotle may well agree. Excellence and habit. Aristotle believed that excellence is not primarily about achievement, but about habit. Excellence is a habit. It is about working tirelessly on the formation of virtuous habits so that they become second nature. Thanks partly to the legacy of Ellen White's teaching, we as Adventists have placed strong emphasis on the formation of good habits in both home and school. This formation of good habits is, like sanctification, the work of a lifetime. Excellence is more a habit, less an achievement. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence is the work of a lifetime. Excellence and freshness. The English poet and priest Gerard Manley Hopkins says in his poem, God's Grandeur, The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. And for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness, deep down things. But while the development of habits of thinking are important, good teaching depends also on freshness, on creativity. There is a willingness to uh, revisit the old formulae the tired conventions, and an eagerness to make new connections. It is a readiness to submit the sharply contoured, contoured certainties of morning to the nuances of afternoon light and the shadows of evening. I found that students came most eagerly to class when they did so with the expectation that something fresh was going to happen that something might take them by surprise, that old things would be said but in new ways, and that maybe, just maybe, that the world would never look quite the same again. 
Freshness and habit can live together, but they live in tension. And the teachings of Jesus amply demonstrate this. You have heard it said, but I say unto you, excellence lives in tension. Excellence involves living in tension. Excellence and blossoming. Aristotle's notion of virtue involves the idea of flourishing, of blossoming, of becoming fully vir, V-I-R, virtue, virile, a true man, or in our more open society, a true human being. Aristotle's idea of excellence as part of virtue is not a million miles away from a biblical notion of flourishing as found in Psalm 1 and verse 3. The blessed, the virtuous, are like trees planted by streams of water that yield their fruit in its season and their leaf does not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. Jesus said that we find blessedness, we prosper, in unexpected places, in adversity, in the company of those very different from ourselves, in serving others, and in so doing those others slowly return to us the gift of our true selves. What greater gift could we desire? What further excellence? could be sought. Excellence and community. Aristotle says that virtue is to be found within a community. You cannot be virtuous alone. You cannot become excellent alone. But of course, Aristotle spoke from within a certain type of privileged community, an elite. Jesus is far more radical. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those that mourn. Blessed are the peacemakers, and so on. Blessedness is to be found in the company of those unlike you, the disadvantaged. And in in losing yourself, you mysteriously find yourself. In serving, you find fulfillment. You blossom. You find your true self, you excel, you stand out from your previous self. Excellence then is to be found in community. It means being willing to subordinate your own interests to others. It means being subject to others on occasion without becoming a cipher. Aristotle saw it as one of the supreme virtues by which the virtuous person should live. He taught in ancient Athens a society quite unlike ours. He was part of the ruling class. He would not expect the lower order to aspire so high, nor could he have imagined that blessedness was to be found in the company of the outsider, the downtrodden, the leper, the impure. Jesus expanded our idea of community. No, rather, Jesus exploded our idea of community. Excellence and contentment. From a Christian perspective, there is still one piece of the picture missing. Our striving after excellence excellence could become relentless and leave us restless and forever discontent. In the pursuit of excellence, there is room for satisfaction and contentment. We can pause and see that our work is very good. There is a moment when we can be still and rest satisfied with our efforts. And I think the true gift which the Venigo Committee has has given us is the assurance that our work has shown some good quality, that our efforts have yielded some good fruit. And not only us, it is true of so many with whom whom we four 
have worked over so many years and in so many different places. Let us hear then, let us all hear that affirmation. Let us rest content with that, with that affirmation for a while. And then we hear the voice of the Apostle Paul when he says to the believers in Corinth, I will show you a still more excellent way. Excellence always involves moving on. Now we owe Aristotle a debt of gratitude for his profound insights into human nature and behavior and into the world in which we live, into everyday things. Our indebtedness to Aristotle is probably greater than any of us recognize. But the more excellent way announced in chapter 12 of the first Corinthian letter blossoms in chapter 13 into the invitation to the surrender to agape love. And with this, excellence moves on to a different plane altogether. It goes beyond the clanging cymbals and noisy gongs of achievement, even the achievement of all knowledge. In Christian education, the achievement of results without the accomplishments of love has a hollow ring to it. Gandhi said that people divide into two groups, travellers and settlers. Some Venegar recipients have been travellers. Helen and I have been settlers. But Gandhi added that if you choose to settle, you have to dig your wells deep. And for us, that has meant digging deep into the roots of a resourceful community here at Newbold and digging deep into the overwhelming love of God. Without these, we would have been quite exhausted of any resource. The call to excellence is still to be heard. Charles Eliot Venegar echoed it. Perhaps Jesus had something of this in mind when he talked about giving all to acquire the pearl of great price. Now, giving all is a risk in any field of human endeavour. It is a risk. It is a risk of trust. A risk of trust that we four have found worth taking. And we plan to continue, but can only continue in the company of people such as yourselves, who also have a deep thirst for the more excellent way. And so let us continue our journey together.